Someone once said, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Meaning something that may seem broken or worthless could actually be a priceless gem. This is the story of us and Jesus. When reading the Gospel of Luke, we can witness the transformative power of Jesus on every page. We can see that nothing is too broken for Jesus to heal, and no one is worthless. All who believed in the Savior were restored. Jesus built his church on the faith of willing misfits who thought their story was over when it was only beginning. This invitation remains as true today as it was in the first century. Nothing is too broken. No one is worthless. And all who call on the name of Jesus can begin again. Uh, before I do my welcome, I want to take some time to honor uh, the veterans among us. So if you served in the armed services, would you stand up so we can just honor you and to say... Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we understand that your loved ones uh, sacrificed a tremendous amount um, as well. So just thank you. And it's important for us not to take the liberties that we have uh, for granted. There are places in the world where we can't do what we're doing, worship Jesus. Uh, but sadly, even in the midst of our liberties of worshiping Jesus, houses of worship have now become uh, homes of terror. 30 miles from uh, where I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, as you know, last week, there was another mass shooting um, in a church. Uh, before we go on to pray for uh, the families of the victims, uh, I want you to know that Pastor Tim Jordan, who kind of oversees what ha happens on the grounds of Transformation Church, for several years, um, our security teams have been in place, and so we take security seriously. And it's, and it's sad that we even have to do that. Um, you know, in the 70s, the 80s, I, I just, 90s, I don't remember mass shootings just happening all the time. So we're going to pray, and there needs to be action. You know, I'm not a politician. <laughs> Thank goodness. Just kidding. Um, so I don't really know what needs to be done, but something must be done because with prayer comes action. Um, but I do know there are families that are just hurting um, in ways that are unimaginable and indescribable. And the older I get, uh, the more I'm appreciating uh, what theolo theologians of yesterday would say, the the holy unknowingness of God, that there are things that we don't know, but we can trust God because he's shown himself to be good, primarily in the cross and in the resurrection. And so even in the midst of this, we, we trust him. So, so would, you, would you join me in praying for those families of the victims in Texas? Uh, Father, we just, uh, at moments like this, uh, we are just left speechless. The horror, the shock, it is, it is saddening that my children, other people's children will not grow up in a country that mass shootings is not something that's rare or foreign, but it seems to be coming normative. I don't know what needs to be done, but I know something needs to be done, but I know that we as the church must pray. We pray that you would give peace and hope supernaturally to the victims uh, of the families, and we pray that your restraining grace would move and that we as a people would, would move. So much heartbreak, so much sadness. In the midst of the heartbreak and of the sadness, may we be a people of hope and life and joy to be the very hands and feet of Jesus in our broken world. Uh, Lord, would you come back? But don't come back too quickly because there's people who still are yet to know you. 
We love you in Christ's name. God's people said, amen. So teenagers, we're continuing our series, You Can Begin Again. And so basically what we've done is we've gone through the gospel of Luke. One of the things that I want to help us as the church is to not think of the gospel just as what happened to Jesus on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. There's a reason why the gospel of Luke is called the gospel of Luke because the whole book is about Jesus and all of Jesus' life is good news of what the kingdom of God is. So I hope that you have spent time reading the gospel of Luke written by the good Gentile doctor Luke himself. So we're going to pick up part two of a message called You Can Come Home. It's the story of the prodigal son. And what's interesting is it really shouldn't be called the prodigal son. It should actually be called the prodigal father because the word prodigal means lavish. And so what we see is a father's prodigal or lavish love for his sons. And in this story, you and I eventually are the sons. At times we're the younger son and other times we're the older son. So what I want to do is catch you Up to speed, and then we're going to move into message two. So let's dive into the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 20. The audience is really important, okay? Jesus sitting at Starbucks, all right? He's talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and also the Jewish people who are outside of the religious community, the marginalized, the outcast. And Jesus is about to tell a story, a a parable. And when you read parables, parables are Jesus' way of saying, I want you to enter into what the world should be like. That's what a parable is designed to do. Jesus speaking, he also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. Let me stop right now. The first century audience that would have, Jesus would have been speaking to, primarily Jewish, they would have lost their minds. They would have been like, wait, what? This younger son did what to his dad? You got to understand, in a Middle Eastern culture, respect and honor for a father is a whole different thing. I mean, it is next level, right? And so for him to ask for his estate now, basically what he's saying is, dad, I want you to die. According to Deuteronomy 21, 17, When the father would die, the older son would inherit two-thirds of the estate, the younger son one-third of the estate. So the younger son asking for his inheritance now is basically saying, oh, man, I want you to die. What happens is the father's estate gets cut in one-third. Everybody in the village is like, ooh, can you believe this? So this is a lot of shame. So he distributed the assets, listen to this, to them. Did you catch that? Not just to him, but to them. He even gave it to the older brother at the time. Not many days later, the youngest son had gathered all together, uh, together all he had and traveled to a distant country. The way this is written in the Greek language is he got the property, he got the assets, and he cashed them out and sold them. So the land that used to belong to the dad now belongs to somebody else. How would you like to wake up every day to look at the property that should have been your son's and it's somebody else's? You're perpetually reminded of his disobedience. Where he squandered his estate in foolish living. So young buck got paid, got some money, and he went buck wild. He got lit, whatever you want to call it. The Bible calls it foolish. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Now, I want you to picture this. Go back 2,000 years. A famine is much different than now. Now, America hears about a famine, you get a jumbo 747, you fly to that country, you drop food off. There are no jumbo 747s back then. A famine meant everybody dies. So this young man is in a desperate state. Verse 15, then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. Time out. This Jewish audience would have lost their ever lasting minds. This is action packed with racial conflict. What kind of people had pigs? The Gonim, the Gentiles. And let me put some flesh on it. This would be like 
a neo-Nazi leaving his neo-Nazi squad saying, I'm going to go work for Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. Like, this is bad. The audience would have been like, wait a second. Not only did this good Jewish boy disrespect his daddy, but now he's going to go to work for them? Now, you think about it. As a Jewish person, how would you think about Gentiles? First of all, they made you slaves in Africa through Pharaoh. Then you got set free. And then the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Nivites, the Jesubites, the Anstedbites, wanted to destroy, enslave, kill you. Then you get to the promised land, and now these Italians, forget about it, are ruling and oppressing you. Let me, let me add some more. It would be like Vladimir Putin and Russia running America with an iron fist. That's what's happening here. And let me pause here. Please, please, and I'm going gonna, gonna to get passionate. Know it's from a heart of love. Please start reading the Bible in its context. Because if you don't, you're going to make up stuff about the Bible and be disappointed. And God's like, I didn't say that anyway. You know what we, we do? And when we read the Bible, you think you're the Jews, the good guys. You're not. You would have been the Gentiles. I would have been the oppressor. And I, it would have worked for me as a Gentile. Why would I want to be a Jew when the system was tilted systemically for the Romans to rule? You wouldn't have been the Jews. You would have been the Gentiles unless you're ethnically Jew. Guys, it's important that we read this Bible. This story is explosive. This audience would have been like, what are you kidding me? He disrespected his dad, and now he's with those people? By the way, if you use the words those people or them, are they talking about another ethnic group, you might have some problems. <laughs> Guys, there is no those or them or they. It's only us and we. Some of us just have better tans. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Check this out. Now listen to this, guys. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating. Oh, my goodness, this poor child. But no one would even give him anything. He, they wouldn't even give him the pig slop. Never forget this. Sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you have, and keep you longer than you want to stay. People be like, God don't want us to have fun. Is this fun? When he came to his senses, that means he repented, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and I'm here, I'm dying of hunger. You know, like at my daddy crib, the workers got good food. Spam, ham, I got lamb, ram, okay. Third service, man. You never know where this thing is going. Verse 18. <laughs> I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. This is a Jewish idiom that, that is basically saying sin is not primarily against a person. When I hurt someone else, it's actually an offense against God. I just wonder how we would treat people if we viewed it from that perspective, that when I hurt someone else, it's an offense God. It is an offense. Sin primarily, if I offend you, it is primarily, first and foremost, an offense against God because you're made in the image of God. I wonder how that would affect how we treat other human beings. Let me pause here for a moment and go on a holy rampage. One of the things that's disturbing me as a Christian and when I say Christian, I mean like all of us, is why are we so mean? It's amazing that we serve a God of great tenderness and great love, and we lose our minds on Facebook. I know what you say on Facebook because I creep. Yeah, I follow you on Facebook. <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, keeping up with y'all. And particularly about politics, man, we just lose. I'm just, help me understand where it became a biblical virtue to say things like, why are they being, you don't need to be politically correct. Just say what's on your mind and tell it like it is. Where, where's, where's that in the Bible? It's not in the fruit of the Spirit, right? And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Where is love, kind, goodness, and be idiotic and mean on Facebook? Is, is that, like, who's discipling us? 
CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. That's why we want you to read the Bible. That's why we want you in the Word of God. It's got to wallpaper our minds to put on Jesus' glasses to see the kingdom of God and to see people for what they are, to value people. You will know my disciples because they're mean. Is that what it says in John 17? You will know my disciples because they love one another. Verse 19, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This poor kid thought his daddy would reject him. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. So check this out. When you and I come home, like the younger son, God to Abba, teenagers, once again, this word Abba is an Aramaic word, and it's daddy. It's a, it's a, it's a word of tenderness. God to Abba welcomes you with compassion. 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 Compassion means to suffer with. So the moment that boy made that poor decision and went to the distant country, the daddy suffered and hurt for his son. You know why? Because his son meant out on what he was created for. What we have to do as the church is we, begin, we, must, we must begin to give a bigger picture of what it means to follow Jesus. For most folks, if you were to talk to them and go, what do you think about Christians? I don't know if the word compassionate would come up. I think the words don't do this, don't do this, stop this, stop that, stop this, don't do this. I, I just wonder if we talked about God wants us to flourish as human beings. And that's primarily a way to relate to other people a way to enjoy the world. And what sin does is it disrupts and it corrupts our flourishing. And even in the midst of our corruption and disruption of what God's created us to be, i.e. sin, God goes, man, I love you and I know you're hurting. Like on the cross, God goes, I know you're hurt. Isn't it a, isn't it a, isn't it a beautiful God who, who, goes, who goes, listen, what you're doing is wrong, but I'm gonna pay for your wrong. compassion. So he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with rage. Come here, boy. I told you, you knucklehead. I knew you was going to mess up. Look at you. No. Compassion. He ran and threw his arms around his neck. Why did the daddy run? Here's why the dad ran. Now, this is hard for us as Western people to understand because we're children of what's called the Enlightenment, and you don't even know it. And so my job is to help us break free from this because it's actually corrupted our faith in a very negative way, okay? So the Bible is a communal book. It's about us and we. So when this son offended his father, it offended the whole community because the son was a part of the whole community. Now, the way you and I are taught to think because we're children of the enlightenment is me. It's about me. As a matter of fact, the worship songs that are sung throughout contemporary Christianity sound a lot like this. Here I come to worship. I'm just by myself. No, here we come to worship. When you read the Bible and you see a you, it's the second personal pronoun. It's a plural you. It means us. And so what Western individualism out of the Enlightenment does, it's, well, meet Jesus in my Bible. I got my rights. I can do what I want to do. Husbands, your decisions affect your family for generations. Wives, your decisions affect your family for generations. Teenagers, your decisions affect your family. One of the big things that teenagers love to say, well, if you don't want to know the truth, don't ask the question. Really? Really? No, your decisions affect other people. We're not individualistic atoms floating in the universe. We are all interconnected. Imagine if I decided to lose my mind and just go sin crazy. That would break some of your hearts. It would hurt my wife. It would hurt my kids. It's more than just me. 
We must move away from this individualistic, me, Jesus, and my Bible. No, we need all of us to be everything that God has created us to be. No Lone Ranger Christians. We're a family. So why did he run? Because the village elders would have been looking for the boy too. They were waiting for him to come home. What they would have done is they would have caught him at the village gates. They would have taken a pot and symbolically smashed it at his feet to say, you're banished, you're not welcome. The dad ran to beat them. So when he gets there, threw his arms around his neck that's very tame. It was like he tackled and shielded his son. He tackles and shields his son to say, if you're going to banish him, it's going to be over my dead body. It's a picture of the cross. <laughs> There's no banishment here today. There's not going to be any banishing here today. I don't know who this is for. I don't know what you've done, but there's no banishment here today. And then he kissed him. We learn in the Old Testament that a kiss is a sign of forgiveness. The son had a great speech prepared, but the daddy wouldn't even let him get the words out of his mouth. He embraced him and he kissed him and he forgave him. The beauty and the power of the cross is when Jesus died, he died for your and my past, present, and future sins, that we live in the eternal Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. We swim in the essence of forgiveness. As a matter of fact, forgiveness can be our middle name because of the family that we belong to. Now, this doesn't make you want to sin. It makes us want to worship. Here's, here's, the, here's the thing. If you don't get forgiveness, you'll live with guilt and shame. And guilt and shame is... Okay, this is really gross. You ready? This is, this, is so, this is gross. But it came to my mind. I'm going to share it. So I love our cat, Mr. Boots. I told you about Mr. Boots, right? <laughs> now, I didn't think I was going to be one of these weird pet people, but I am. <laughs> I love me some Mr. Boots. But sometimes he's like 20 pounds. He's big boned. <laughs> sometimes we'll wait too long to feed him, and because he has a huge appetite, um, he'll eat really fast, and then he'll throw up. And we kind of take our time to clean up the throw up because he'll eat it. <laughs> and we won't have that much to clean up. <laughs> Guess Mr. Boots got a good digestive system. It works for our family. I need, to, I, I need to land this plane. My wife's in the front like, you're sharing way too much information. <laughs> you want to know how I learned not to clean up the vomit anyway? My wife told me, she's like, Don't, he'll, 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 he'll eat it. Don't worry, he'll eat it. I was like, oh, is that how you do it? Okay, thanks, I learned something new. So here's my deep spiritual point. Vomit is a rejection of something, right? Well, when we live with guilt and shame, we'll end up, quote, unquote, vomiting, but staying around and eating the same things that made us sick because we're living in guilt and shame. That's what guilt and shame does. So when God gives you forgiveness, he goes, you are forgiven. And remember, everything in the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. And everything in the Old Testament is concealed, right? And, and, and so, but, but watch this. I'm going to quote to you Micah 7, 18, and 19, and it's basically the story that Jesus is teaching. Look at this. I love this. Who is a God like you? Forgiving inequity. That, that just means sin. And passing over rebellion. The son was rebellious. For the remnant of his inheritance, he does not hold on to his anger forever. Why? Because he delights in faithful love. Man, God delights in love. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our inequities. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Wow. 
If you're a follower of Christ, if you're not yet one, just hold on for a minute. But if, if you're a follower of Christ, think of the imagery. All your sins, even sins we haven't even committed, God has thrown into the depths of the sea. Here's my question. Here's my plea. Would you stop putting on your scuba gear and diving down to revisit him? Well, God has forgotten. He's buried in the depths of the sea. Will you do that? When you come home, God the Abba welcomes you with restoration into his family. And how does he do it? He gives us gifts. Check this out. But the father told his servants, quick. Hey, this is deep. You know what quick means in Greek? Quick. Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Wow. When you come home to daddy's house, he gives you a robe of righteousness. Can you imagine this boy? He's been sleeping with pigs, right? He didn't have no, no, no money to, to like go to the mall. He had on rags and filth and stench. And his dad's like, quick, bring the best robe. Zach, bring the best robe. Thank you, my good friend. Oh, yeah. It looks absolutely ridiculous now, but in 97, it was clean. <laughs> Early September, Indianapolis Colts playing the Miami Dolphins. I was like, what am I going to break out at the beginning of the year? My all-white suit, all eyes were on me as I got on the team playing. I was like, what's up? <laughs> Specially designed for Derwin Gray, yeah, you, you can't fit it because it's fitted for me. By the way, it's hard to tighten it up now because I was like 45 pounds less than I am now. If I went all the way down, a button may hit one of you and kill you. <laughs> but hey, hey, seriously though, but, but check it out. There's a psychology behind this, y'all. I'm a welfare kid. I grew up poor. People laughed at my clothes. Like, like people laughed at my clothes. So I was like, you know, outside of Christ, I'm going to find my security in something. So I found it in clothes. And I was like, ooh-wee. And when I got this suit on, I was like, yeah. It, I didn't even walk. I glided. <laughs> and you best believe when I was eating and I wore, wore this, I avoided stuff that could get me dirty. Why? Because of the way I saw myself. Guess what? When you come home, your daddy has a robe for you too. It's a robe of righteousness. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. This would have been an allusion to Isaiah 61.10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Teenagers and preteens, notice what it says. It doesn't say I rejoice greatly in my girlfriend, my boyfriend. Those are good things, but they're not God things. To, uh, moms and dads, I don't rejoice greatly in how awesome my kids are or the job I got or how big my house is. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Watch this now. And wrap me in a robe of righteousness. Hey, friends, on the cross, Jesus, oh, my goodness, on the cross, on that bloody cross, on the cross, God the Father exchanged the very righteousness of Jesus for your unrighteousness, for my unrighteousness. And he said, here, put on this new coat. You're in the family. Guys, not only does this restore us with God, but it changes how you see yourself. This changed my moral behavior when I saw myself as righteous. And this is how I stopped stuttering. For those of you who don't, knew, don't know, I'm a compulsive stutterer. I stuttered until I was 26 years, years old. At 26 years old, I became a Christian. I stopped stuttering. People go, what speech therapist did you go to? Clothed in righteousness. I began to see myself as God sees me. A lot of my stuttering was rooted in abuse I experienced and low self-esteem. I don't believe in self-esteem. I believe in God-esteem. Self-esteem is built on what you do. God-esteem is built on what Jesus has done. And so I began to see myself as God sees. As a matter of fact, one of the songs of heaven is this. Oh, I wish they would see what I see. God has clothed you in righteousness. In the very righteousness of Jesus. And then I love this. As a groom wears a turban. That's awesome. You guys need to wear a turban next time you get married. 
And as a bride adorns herself with jewels, I love the imagery of a man and a woman right there pictured in God himself. That is so awesome. Romans 3.22, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction. God wants you to see yourself as righteous. That when you come home, God says, I, I'm going to wrap you in a robe of righteousness. Next, he's like, get him a ring, a ring of sonship, a, a ring of, of daughtership. Look what the scripture says. Put a ring on his finger. Zach, I need a ring. Oh, yeah. Uh, put that on there. Boom. Yeah. A ring. I had the honor and privilege of winning a state championship in high school. Got a ring for that. I won four conferences, uh, championships in college at BYU. I got rings for that. By the way, it's going to be a long time before BYU wins a ring again. They're terrible. <laughs> it's hard, man. It's hard watching the games. I love them, but they're not playing too good. But anyway, here's the, here's the point. Uh, when, I, when I wear this ring, this is 1992 Western Athletic Conference Championship ring. We won four of them. When I wear this and I see my brothers that I went to battle with, it's almost like Wonder Twins activate. You know what I'm saying? Like we touch and like all the, like, like we are a family. We have a shared and collective experience. So guess what? When you come home, the father spiritually gives you a ring, and what this ring is saying is, you're my son, you are my daughter, and now you have my authority. What's mine is yours. And just like this wedding ring says, I belong to Vicky, our spiritual ring says, we belong to the father. Some of you are living as though you're orphans spiritually. You've been adopted into the family of God. You've got a robe of righteousness, and you have a ring of sonship and daughtership. God is saying, do you see what I see? But next, when you come home, the Father gives you sandals or shoes. Check this out. And sandals on his feet. He gives him a robe, he gives him a ring, and then he says, get him some sandals. Why? I'm glad you asked. In the Roman world that Jesus inhabited, 85% of the people were what's called a doulos. It means servant or slave. As a matter of fact, Christians are called doulos of Christ, servant or slaves of Christ. Now, because we're Americans, when we think slavery, we think of the heinous history of America. This is a different type of slavery. It's more being a indentured servant. So let's say, for instance, my man here, you owed me like 10 like 10 grand, okay? And you're like, yo, Derwin, uh, it's been some hard times. I can't pay you. However, my family and I will come and work for you and work it off. Okay, cool. Let's do it. Let's sign a contract, see how long it will take. All right? So 85% of the Roman world operated that way, and they didn't have shoes, which allowed them to be distinguished from people who were free. Free people had shoes. Hired servants did not. And so the son approached his dad as a hired servant. Now, parents, hold on, we, we got a little time here. Can you imagine, and you know, parents, the way we love our kids. Can you imagine your children coming from a psychological perspective that I'm not even worthy to be your child anymore? I, I mean, there's, there's nothing that my kids could ever do to make me ever not love them and embrace them. I'm going all the way. So you know what the dad does? He's like, Zach, bring out the Jordans. <laughs> now, they didn't have Jordans back then. They probably had Air Apostle Pauls, but however, <laughs> we got to modernize this thing. If I'm going to get some shoes, they're going to be some Jordans, and these are not my shoes. My son's foot was bigger than mine when he was in seventh grade. I don't wear a 14. However, I didn't have Jordans. He did. I said, can I borrow them? He was like, word, okay? So, <laughs> so the dad gives him the best robe, a ring, and gives him the shoes to say, no, 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 you're not a servant. You are my son. And guess what? Guess what God the Father says to you? You are my son. You are my daughter. But only if we understood the imagery of what that meant. 
I pray that we get to the point that that stirs our souls. Because for most of us as Americans, oh, I'm a son of God, I'm a daughter of God. No, no, do you know what God went through to make you his son, his daughter. Do you, know what, do, you, do you know what the adoption process was for God? For some of you who've adopted children like the Coverts, you know how hard that is. You know how expensive it is. Well, for God to adopt you, it costs more than money. It costs his son. Now, when you and I get that, we won't have a casual faith. When you and I get that, our souls will burn with worship to go, I'm a son of God. I am robed and I got a ring. And a fattened calf. Not a skinny calf, y'all. A fattened calf. And fat, and, and fat calves have like juices. <laughs> Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. Now, here's what's happening. Jews very rarely ate red meat. And when they did, it was a communal celebration. So he's like, can you imagine the, the uh, dad? Hey, let the whole village know my son is back. You, you know, the one who embarrassed us all and shamed, him, sh shamed our village, he's back. Let's come, let's come eat. I wonder how long the dad saved that calf, knowing the son would eventually come back. Hey, I don't know who this is for, mama's daddies. They're coming back. They're coming back. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. Isn't it cool that God celebrates us with a feast? For some of us, the imagery of God celebrating is like, what? Well, here it is in the Bible. You can believe it or not. The devil don't want you to believe it, but God does. Man, you know what's cool? Um, you get more excited about your kids accomplishing stuff than you do. It's the darndest thing. Having an Oprah moment right now. Like, it's the darndest thing. Like, man, I've been able to do some cool things. My wife's been able to do some cool things. But, man, when our kids come home and they tell us what they do, it's like I clip my toenails. Woo! -hoo -hoo! Yeah! <laughs> I mean, you get excited. You know, when you're out there watching your son play and you're like, he's so much better than me. And then your daughter comes home like, I'm going to major in psychology and neuroscience. Yeah! I mean, you just get excited. Why? Because you love your kids. Well, guess what? God does the same for you. And that's hard for us to believe. You know why? Because we think God loves us based on what we do. If God loved us based on what we do, we would be orphans. Because God loves us based on what his son does, we are forever children. Here's some of the saddest language in scripture. Man, this is sad. The older brother was further from home than the younger brother, even though he lived with his daddy. Even though he lived in the house with his daddy, he was further away from home than the one who left the house. Now his older brother was in the field, and he came near the house, and he heard music and dancing. People who are religious, as in who are not in contact with the grace of God, are not very happy people. You ever meet those people? It's like, man, a hundred people got baptized. Were they really saved, pastor? <laughs> Why do you guys have to have music outside when people are baptized? Can't it just be miserable? <laughs> I'll be sitting there like, this is a happy time, ain't it? What do you need taco trucks for? Because tacos are heavenly, that's why. <laughs> Jesus ate fish tacos. It says that in the Greek, when he resurrected from the dead, he was eating fish on the, okay. <laughs> so he summoned one of the servants, questioning these, what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him. Your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Hey, man, your brother who was tripping, man, the one who was addicted, the one, he's back, he's safe, he's sound. Then he became angry 
and didn't want to go in. By the way, y'all, that's a picture of hell. There's no one in hell who doesn't want to be there. There's no one in hell going, yeah, I would like to go to hell. Nope. Nope. I don't want nothing to do with grace. I don't want nothing to do. I, I can do it myself. And they spend eternity worshiping themselves. Now, so his father came out and pleaded with him. If this is me, if I'm in this story, I'm like, why are you tripping, man? That's Hebrew, by the way. Look, your brother, you, you, the one you grew up with, the one you used to wrestle with, the one you used to beat up, you, the one that you love, you remember? He's back and you don't want to celebrate him? Forget you. That's why I'm not God. But look what God does. He comes out of the party and he pleads with his son. The same grace that reached the younger son is the same grace extended to the older son. They were both far from home, but in different locations. But he replied to his father, here it is, y'all. Look, I have been slaving many years for you. Not, dad, I love you. No, no, I've been slaving. Let me do a test here. And teenagers, please listen, particularly if you're one of those straight lace kids and something bad goes down. <laughs> well, God, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't have sex. I read my Bible. I go to TC Teens. Look how hard I've been working, and you let this bad stuff happen to me. Be careful. That's not a love relationship. That's a contract. That's I do this, you do that. And God is going, the contract has already been settled. It's called the cross. It's called the resurrection. If you want to know if I love you, go to a Jerusalem hill to that garbage dump and look at the nail-pierced Savior who rose again, who bled for all time and eternity to give you a new life. You know what this son is like? It's like uh, Thanksgiving. Can you imagine the matriarch and the patriarch of your family, they're old and gray and, and, and you're there because of them and they're sitting at the table and everybody's talking, but not to them. You're just eating the food, then you get up and leave. Thanksgiving isn't about the food, y'all. It's about the people at the table. A lot of Christianity is I'm coming to eat the food, but I don't want to talk to the one who prepared it. Be careful. That's what he's doing. And listen to this arrogance. And I never disobeyed your orders. Never? Yet, you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. I wonder if the dad was like, I know you and your friends. I don't want to be around them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but when this son of yours came who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, uh-oh, here's another key to why he's mad. So when the boy left, one-third of the estate was gone. The boy comes back. He cuts into his brother's two-thirds. Ooh, people get funny when you mess with their money. Now, I'm going to challenge you here, and I want you to hear my heart, okay? I want you to hear my heart. My job is not to give you spiritual no-do so you can go to sleep, but to challenge the cultural idols in our lives, okay? It is amazing how we can justify some sins in political candidates and vilify the same sins in another political candidate that's called political idolatry, and the church needs to be purged of political idolatry. Please, hear what I'm saying. We don't worship a donkey. We don't worship an a, 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 a elephant. We worship a lamb, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> hey, listen, there's a whole generation of Christians under the age of 30 who don't want anything to do with Christianity because they go, you guys are just about a certain particular brand of politics. Like the same guy was in office like many, many years ago and you guys said he was the scourge of the earth. Then another one got in office and you're like, he's awesome. Uh, listen to what I'm saying. The lesser of two evils is still evil. And I don't see in the Bible where I'm supposed to partner with evil. Like where did that come from? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Think from a kingdom of God perspective. 
But when you begin to mess with assets and money, we begin to justify stuff. Don't sell your soul. Jesus already bought it. Did y'all catch that? They got it over here. Son, he said to him, this is sad. You're always with me and everything I have is yours. Everything the father had was his and he didn't even know it because he didn't have covenant with his dad. He didn't have relationship with his daddy. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. Let me pause here. I don't know what this is for and I got to be quick. Christianity is not about let's get bad people to become good. It's about spiritually dead pe- people being born again. So if you're here today going, man, am I, a- a- am I lost because I'm bad? No, you're lost because you're dead and God wants to make you alive by grace. Because of this, your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. So what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate communion. But before we do, I'm going to pray for those of you who are yet to discover Christ and follow him to follow him, and then we're going to have some communion. And then after that, we're going to party. We're going to celebrate, okay? Because typically as Christians, communion is like, oh, I'm a sinner. No, we need to celebrate, y'all, like lose our everlasting minds, all right? Okay. Where's our worship team at? Where y'all at? Y'all supposed to come over here. Where y'all at? Because they know they don't want me to lead worship. Woo! Oh, man, it would be bad. Really, really bad, all right? So before they pass out the elements, will you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you whether if we are the younger son or the older brother, you meet us with the same generous grace. I pray that we would wear the robe of righteousness, the ring of sonship, and the sandals of sonship as an act of worship to say thank you, Lord, for welcoming me back home. And he would give the same to the older brother as well. Hey, right now in this moment, if you're saying, hey, pastor, you know what, Um, I think I'm the older brother, or I think I'm the younger son. I'm ready to follow Jesus. If you're ready to follow him in the silence of your heart, would, would would you say this to him? Today, Lord Jesus, I want to begin again. I've heard an incredible story about your father, that he's compassionate, that he's beckoning me to come home. Today I choose to come home. If that's you, just say this to him in the silence of your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that on that cross you exchanged my unrighteousness for your righteousness. I believe that on that cross your blood was shed to forever forgive my sins. And I believe that though you died, I died with you. But on the third day, I was risen to new life with you. Now I'm a part of your family. Our forever family. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Uh, At this time, I want our hospitality team to pass out the elements. And as they are passing out the elements, I'm going to explain it a little bit. And we're going to have an incredible uh, just time. Uh, The team is going to be playing softly behind us. And as they're doing so, and after we receive the elements, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go into a song, and, and we're just going to celebrate, okay? And even when you're singing, think about those who are the younger brother who doesn't know the grace of God, and those who are the older brother who don't know the grace of God, and that one day they would be sitting right next to you. And also let the overflow of God's abundance minister grace to you as well.
2,000 years ago, our Jewish Messiah, he looked at his Jewish disciples, and it was Passover time, which is a, the greatest celebration in Israel's history. It's when God delivered them from captivity and slavery out of Egypt. And he looked at him, and he, and he took bread, and he broke it, which was normal. But then he said, this is my body broken for you. Now, I want you to think about this. Like, what, what manner of love is that, that God would be broken for you? I know I've been the younger son, the older brother, and the crazy cousin. But God's grace is the same. You are never beyond the repair of a God who'd be broken for you. Let us together, brothers and sisters, receive the broken body of our Lord. And next, he, he, took, he took wine and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. In this story, there's a fattened calf, a, a lamb. And you see that ultimately that the lamb is, is Jesus, the, the lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. My, my prayer for you and my prayer for, for me and my prayer for us as a church is that the very heartbeat of our existence would be this love from the Lamb of God. Now, when Jesus forgives, he, he utterly forgives. I'm talking thrown to the bottom of the sea into God's forgotten memory. But in this forgiveness is power too. Power to overcome the things that asked us that we had to ask for forgiveness in the first place. So, so it's, it's victory, it's, it's celebratory, it's love. The greater that we experience God's love, the more loving we become. Man, I pray, and I know KJ and Laura and this fabulous team, and I'm a decent preacher, but I pray that the greatest advertisement, the Transformation Church, is people would go, listen, those people are so loving. Jesus said, you and I are my disciples because they love one another. Let us drink together the cup of love. Father, we thank you so much that you run to, to cover us and shield us, to forgive us, that you give us robes of righteousness, a ring of sonship, shoes on our feet. You do so not because we are worthy. You do so because your son Jesus is worthy. Worthy is the lamb. So, Father, as we come out of this moment, may we have a great moment of celebration and worshiping the lamb who is worthy. We pray this in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen.